With the rise of anti-Semitism in Germany, Gandhi advised the persecuted Jews to bravely claim Germany as their home. For he was sure that religious resistance against the godless fury of a dehumanized man would bring forth the inner strength and joy given to them by Jehovah. Anticipating the devastating consequences of war, Gandhi wrote to Herr Hitler, the one person who could prevent a war that would reduce humanity to a savage state. Must you pay this price for an object, however worthy it may appear to you? Will you listen to the appeal of one who has deliberately shunned the method of war? He asked. At last, the long apprehended war between England and Germany broke out. Flouting Indian opinion, the British government declared India a belligerent country and promulgated ordinances which affected the Indian people vitally. After his talks with the Viceroy at Simla, Gandhi made it clear that his sympathies were with the Allies from the purely humanitarian standpoint. He appealed to British statesmen to open a new chapter for all those who were held under imperial bondage. Condemning the Nazi aggression, the Indian National Congress declared that though the Indian people had no quarrel with any other people, they had a deep-rooted quarrel with systems which glorified war and violence and suppressed the human spirit. And that India could not associate herself with a war said to be for democratic freedom when that very freedom was denied to her. It invited the British government to declare its war aims in unequivocal terms and added, a free and democratic India will gladly associate herself with other free nations for the advancement of humanity. Making a fervent appeal to India to adopt non-violence as her creed and preserve man's dignity, Gandhi wrote, Defense of India by the present method has been necessary because she is an appendage of Britain. Free India can have no enemy. It is better for India to discard violence altogether, even for defending her borders. For India to enter into the race for armaments is to court suicide. With the loss of India to non-violence, the last hope of the world will be gone. With the British government's rejection of nationalist opinion, Gandhi was convinced that its old policy of divide and rule was to continue. His reaction was, our independence is not to depend upon anyone's mercy. It will come when the people are ready for it. The Congress declared that Indian freedom could not exist within the orbit of imperialism and asked its ministries to resign in protest. For a while, to pass beyond the darkness that enveloped the destiny of the world, Gandhi and Kasturbai visited Shanti Niketan at Poet Tagore's invitation in February 1940. The two apostles of India's regeneration met. The poet's simple mud hut, Shyamli, was Gandhi's abode here. Notwithstanding his ill health, Tagore came to the mango grove to express his love and reverence for Gandhi. Thank you. 
for it welcomed Gandhi as one of their own and as one belonging to all humanity. In a spirit of deep respect, Gandhi replied, Shanti Niketan will never cease to grow so long as Gurudev's spirit broods over it. During their talks, Gandhi saw that Tagore was living for his dearest creation, Vishwabharti, and wanted to feel sure about its future. As they parted, Tagore handed over to Gandhi his impassioned appeal. Vishwabharti is like a vessel which is carrying the cargo of my life's best treasure. Accept this institution under your protection. Gandhi assured him, Vishwabharti carries God's protection because it is the creation of an earnest soul. You may depend upon my doing all for its permanence. Events were moving with their own momentum. Since India was to continue under the imperial domain, positive action became inevitable. The Congress, at its annual session held at Ramgar in March 1940, under the presidentship of Maulana Abul Kalam Azad, placed full responsibility for conducting the civil disobedience campaign on Gandhi. Stressing the need of discipline, Gandhi said, the essence of Satyagraha is not to shout slogans, but to carry out in letter and spirit the word of your chosen general. Gandhi commended his thirteenfold constructive program. In the fulfillment of it lay the non-violent attainment of Swaraj based on the solid foundation of social justice and economic equality, enabling each individual to have the wherewithal to supply all his primary needs. Correlating economics and ethics Gandhi advocated the Upanishadic message of enjoying wealth by renouncing it for the common good. He enunciated the theory of trusteeship to transform the acquisitive society into an egalitarian one. A society based on non-violence cannot nurture any other ideal. Reluctant to carry the policy of non-embarrassment to the point of self-extinction, Gandhi decided to launch individual satyagraha as a moral protest against war. He chose to keep himself out and selected Vinoba Bhave as the first satyagrahi to preach publicly non-cooperation in the war effort. person by person symbolic protests assumed huge dimensions. Thousands answered the call, proclaimed their faith and courted imprisonment. On the government forbidding the press to report the progress of Satyagraha, Gandhi suspended the publication of his journals and asked everyone to become his own newspaper carrying authentic news. The theatre of the war came nearer India. Civil disobedience prisoners were set free in December 1941. The nearness of war became a challenge to Gandhi and a test of faith. He resumed the weeklies to disseminate his view that all war is immoral. Gandhi felt that he must accept the necessary consequences and implications of non-violence. He dreamt of India becoming a symbol of non-violence and a messenger of peace. 
and said prophetically, Jawaharlal will be my successor, and when I am gone, he will speak my language. Just then, Sir Stafford Cripps came to India with the proposals of the British War Cabinet on self-government for discussion with representative Indians. Behind the proposals, which dealt essentially with the future after the cessation of hostilities, lay the old imperial policy of creating division in India and encouraging every factor that came in the way of national growth and freedom. There was no intention to part with power in them. Cripps made it clear that the scheme was to be accepted or rejected as a whole. He began a series of negotiations with the leaders of all political parties. On March 27, Gandhi arrived in New Delhi as Cripps was anxious to meet him. Strongly disapproving the indefinite and innumerable partitions involved in the proposals, Gandhi asked, why did you come if this is what you have to offer? Characterizing the offer as a post-dated check, Gandhi soon left for Sevagram. The proposals were rejected by every single party and group in India. Jawaharlal Nehru's reaction was that India would be won in freedom as it had been won in subjection. He said, The clock of destiny is ticking away and war and danger hover over the world. We shall have to face their consequences also and we can only face them by forgetting our petty troubles and conflicts and pulling all together so that we might by our united strength, make India independent. The Crips mission failed. The prospect of freedom receded into some dim and distant future. Inaction at the critical stage became intolerable for Gandhi, who was convinced that India's real safety lay in orderly and timely British withdrawal. Expressing the prevailing mood of the people, Gandhi urged passionately, leave India to God, and if that be too much, leave her to anarchy. To put the Allied cause on an unassailable basis, Gandhi wrote to President Roosevelt that the position of the democracies in the war was morally indefensible so long as India and Africa were not granted independence. India stood in peril of invasion. The Quit India campaign began to take shape in Gandhi's mind. Accepting Gandhi's view that India's bondage enfeebled her for her own defense, the Congress Working Committee proclaimed to the country that British rule in India must end. Only the glow of freedom would enable the people's united will to resist aggression. If the appeal fails, the resolution emphasized, Congress will utilize all its non-violent strength 
for India's liberty under the inevitable leadership of Mahatma Gandhi. The leaders assembled in Bombay on the eve of the All India Congress Committee meeting which had been summoned to endorse the Quit India Resolution. On August 7, 1942, the sullen passivity of the people was converted into a spirit of non-submission and resistance. They assembled at the Gawalia Tank Maidan and awaited the final call for India's deliverance. deeply felt sentiment of the Indian people firmly convinced Gandhi that suppression will never pout the light of revolt once it has been lighted. He came there to guide at the crucial hour with ill will towards none. Opening the proceedings of the historic session, President Azad explained that the Quit India proposal meant withdraw as masters and pointed out power when it comes will belong to the whole people of India. Moving the Quit India Resolution, Jawaharlal Nehru affirmed that its conception was not narrow nationalism and in no sense a threat, but an offer of cooperation of a free India. He asserted the flame that would be kindled by passing the resolution would illumine the darkened horizon. Seconding the resolution, Sardar Patel declared to rouse the people to a supreme effort, it must dawn on them that this is a people's war. Amid deafening applause, the Quit India resolution representing the voice of the oppressed people was carried with overwhelming majority, only 13 voting against. Outlining his plan of action, Gandhi spoke for two hours. The contemplated struggle has its roots in non-violence. I must act when the earth is being scorched by the flames of violence and crying for deliverance. How is this vast mass of humanity to be aflame in the cause of world deliverance unless it has touched and felt freedom? I will have to resist the might of the empire with the might of the dumb millions with non-violence as a policy confined to this struggle. He declared that he would try for an honorable settlement before commencing the actual struggle. Concluding, Gandhi said, Here is a dictum for the non-violent soldier of freedom. Do or die. A few hours later, in the early morning of August 9th, Gandhi was removed from the scene of action and immured along with his party behind the barbed wire isolation of the Aga Khan Palace detention camp at Pune. Members of the working committee were picked off and detained in the fort of Chand Bibi at Ahmednagar. The government got ready their prisons, police and ordinances. India's national pride rose in revolt. Patriotic urge to action moved the people. It was a spontaneous mass upheaval. The temper of the people rose and so did the temper of the alien government.
Six days after the internment, Gandhi's secretary, Mahadev Desai, died suddenly in detention. He served his master to the last. In a corner of the detention grounds, performing the last rites, Gandhi said, This sacrifice cannot but hasten the day of India's deliverance. In his exhaustive correspondence with the Viceroy, Detanu Gandhi asked, Is the demand for independence, legitimate at all times, a challenge that could only be met by immediate repression, instead of patient reasoning with the demanding party. He blamed the government for letting loose an avalanche of leonine violence to suppress a popular movement avowedly non-violent. There was no vestige of acceptance of Gandhi's reasoning. Seeking soothing balm for his pain, Gandhi decided to crucify the flesh by fasting. Seventy-four-year-old Gandhi launched on a 21-day fast on February 10, 1943, in the shadow of the detention camp. Outside the gates stood his sorrow-laden sister, praying in anguish. As days passed into weeks, he grew weaker. His strength had almost ebbed out but he was able to pull through the great ordeal. When Gandhi's life was hanging in the balance, the government set out their unsustainable accusation against Gandhi, replete with inferences and innuendos. Garbled extracts from Gandhi's writings had been torn from their context and presented in a false setting. Gandhi replied, seriatim to the indictment. He characterized it as the case of a prosecutor who first arrests and gags his victims and then opens his case behind their backs. I have no regret for what I have done or said in the course of the struggle for India's freedom, affirmed Gandhi, and suggested reference to an impartial tribunal. In detention, Gandhi spent some time teaching his 74-year-old wife. But it did not last long. Kasturbai's health deteriorated fast. She died as a prisoner on February 22, 1944. Thus ended the 62-year-old companionship of Gandhi and Kasturbai. Gandhi's constant companion in all his life struggle was cremated under his very eyes. Giving vent to his feelings, he said, I cannot imagine life without Bach. A famine of vast dimension overtook the people. Starvation stalked the land. On May 6, 1944, India heaved a sigh of relief on Gandhi's sudden and unconditional release on medical grounds. Before leaving the detention camp, he offered floral tributes to his two departed comrades, Mahadev and Kasturbai, at the consecrated ground. After 21 months of incarceration, Gandhi passed out of the barbed wire. An arduous journey lay ahead. On May 11th, Gandhi once again arrived at Juhu to sojourn at Gandhi Gram and entered on a fortnight's silence to ensure uninterrupted rest. The sea breeze brought him some relief and enabled him to build his broken body.
Every evening, people of all shades crowded on the beach to attend Gandhi's congregational prayer, which he considered to be the greatest binding force maintaining the oneness of the human family. Gandhi's faith in the efficacy of prayer was immovable. He was in tune with the infinite. At a special request, Gandhi gave autographs in ten scripts. Devanagari, Roman, Gujarati, Persian, Tamil, Kannada, Malayalam, Telugu, Bengali and Oriya. If only I had the time, he remarked, I have energy enough to learn more Indian languages. Partially recuperated from his illness, Gandhi reached Sevagram. In an interview, he said that the exploited races would not feel the glow of the Allied victory. He asked, must rivers of blood flow for such an empty victory? Gandhi came to Bombay for a frank and friendly talk with Muhammad Ali Jinnah on the question of communal unity. He went to Jinnah's house on September 9, 1944 as a seeker of light for establishing living peace. The 18-day talks never converged but ran a parallel course and broke down. The cleavage was on the cardinal issue of the two-nation theory. Gandhi had no sense of disappointment or despondency, though the talks did not prove fruitful. At a prayer meeting, he explained, the result confirms my view that the presence of the third power hinders the solution. On Gandhi's 75th birthday, Sevagram Ashram bore a festive appearance. Greetings poured in on October 2nd from all over the world. Albert Einstein asserted, Generations to come, it may be, 
will scarce believe that such a one as this ever in flesh and blood walked upon this earth. Accepting a cheque for 80 lakhs of rupees for the Kasturba Gandhi National Memorial Trust, Gandhi suggested that the memorial should take the form of a movement for the education and economic betterment of women and children in the rural areas in India. The war was drawing to a close. The members of the Congress Working Committee were released. They journeyed to Simla at Lord Wavell's invitation to attend a conference of India's outstanding politicians and party leaders for considering constitutional changes in India. Though Gandhi was not a delegate, he came to Simla as an observer in response to the Viceroy's persistent request. On June 25th, the invitees assembled at Simla. Vindicating its claim to be a truly national organization, the Congress did not subscribe to communal parity. On this rock, the conference founded on July 14th. Gandhi wrote to Lord Wavell, I must not hide from you the suspicion that the deeper cause is, perhaps, the reluctance of the official world to part with power. Gandhi recorded his conviction on the draft United Nations Charter. The exploitation and domination of one nation over another can have no place in a world striving to put an end to all war. The peace must be just and neither punitive nor vindictive. In August 1945, the horror of the atom bomb was loosed on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The Second World War was over. Drawing a moral from the supreme tragedy of the atom bomb, Gandhi reiterated his faith in non-violence. The atom bomb has deadened the finest feeling that has sustained mankind for ages. It will not be destroyed by counter-bombs, even as violence cannot be by counter-violence. In December 1945, when the country was busy preparing for the general elections, Gandhi set out on his tour of Bengal, ravaged by famine and cyclone. His mind was filled with the grim spectre. People crowded the canal bank to narrate their tales of woes to Gandhi. He prescribed to them the spinning wheel, the symbol of the constructive program as a panacea. Gandhi arrived at Madras in January 1946 to attend the Silver Jubilee celebrations of the Dakshin Bharat Hindi Prachar Sabha. He presided over its convocation and distributed certificates to the successful candidates. He observed, it is your dharma to learn Hindustani for the sake of India's Swaraj and for the good and welfare of the people of India. Throughout his sojourn in Madras, Gandhi harped on the need for a national language to achieve unity. Only that language, he asserted, which the people of the country will themselves adopt can become the national language. In between the heavy round of engagements, Gandhi laid the foundation stone of the Harijan Industrial School in true Mason style and visited the constructive program exhibition.
He reiterated that Swaraj could be achieved if people accepted the constructive program. A special train carried Gandhi to Madurai. He was on a pilgrimage in the cause of untouchability. On the way, he addressed the people from the coach and asked for their prayers and blessings for his mission. On February 3rd, Gandhi visited the ancient Meenakshi temple at Madurai, which was thrown open to the untouchables as a result of his long crusade against untouchability. He was glad that the desire which he had entertained for years was fulfilled at last. Crowds continued to surge at all the stoppages during the journey to Palni. Unstintedly, they poured their coppers into Gandhi's beggar's bowl in the service of the Harijan. At the vast meeting held at Palni, under the shadow of the temple, strongly condemning the ulcer of untouchability that pervaded national life, Gandhi argued, why should we not all be the children of one Indian family, and further, of one human family? When untouchability is rooted out, no one will consider himself superior to any other. On February 10, 1946, the weekly Harijan was revived after a lapse of three years and a half. It is the fashion, wrote Gandhi, to blame nature for famine. Scarcity of rain is by no means a monopoly of India. Everything possible should be done to draw water from the bowels of the earth. And food should be grown on all cultivable areas. Dealers must not hoard nor speculate. Cloth famine can be averted by telling the millions to spin and weave in their own villages. Gandhi subscribed to the view that all ailments are due to the violation of nature's laws and that return to nature is the road to health. He opened the nature cure clinic at Uroli Kanchan, a village near Pune, and examined the patients. His prescriptions emphasized use of the five elements of nature, earth, water, air, sun and sky, for he believed that in simple natural remedies lies the villager's hope. Gandhi's outlook on nature cure was essentially spiritual. It was India's hour of destiny. The British Labour government's delegation, consisting of Lord Pethick Lawrence, Sir Stafford Cripps and Mr. A. V. Alexander, arrived in India in March 1946 to discuss terms for the transfer of power. 
The cabinet mission began its work by interviewing leading representatives of the main political parties. Interviews followed interviews to arrive at the greatest common measure of agreement among the different parties. Gandhi came to Delhi to meet the British delegation at the request of Lord Pethick Lawrence and lived at the sweeper's slum. Day after day and week after week, the representatives of India poured in to meet Gandhi and the obscure little sweeper's colony became the venue of many important meetings. Gandhi remained in touch with the mission during the progress of the constitutional negotiations. He declared that he was opposed to the two-nation theory and made it clear that he was speaking entirely for himself. In a discourse, Gandhi said, there is little doubt that India is about to reach her cherished goal of political independence. Let the entrance be prayerful. Independence of my dreams, wrote Gandhi, means the kingdom of God on earth. In concrete terms, independence should be political, economic and moral, standing for the removal of the control of the British army, freedom from the capitalists and capital, ensuring equality between the humblest and the tallest, and freedom from armed defense forces. Free India, he hoped, would continue her non-violent policy and deliver the earth from the burden that was crushing her. Simla was fixed as the venue for further talks. Abul Kalam Azad, Jawaharlal Nehru, Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan and Sardar Vallabhbhai Patel arrived in the first week of May to represent the Congress viewpoint in the conference. Gandhi accepted the delicate role of advisor to the cabinet mission and came to Simla having full faith in the mission's intention. The poor palace continued at the viceregal lodge, but the conference could not achieve an agreement between the Indian National Congress and the Muslim League and broke up on May 12th. After the failure of the Simla conference, the cabinet mission set forth its own plan on May 16th, rejecting the partition of India on defense, economic and administrative grounds. As the crux of the solution, they recommended a united India and the setting up of an interim government to be followed by the constituent assembly. Gandhi compared the mission's plan to a promissory note. Despite some vital defects, he saw in it the germs of the realization of his ideal of a land without sorrow and suffering, provided it was genuine and appealed to the people to think of the country and not of their petty selves, groups or communities. A meeting of the All India Congress Committee was held in July to consider and ratify the Working Committee decision that the Congress should join the proposed Constituent Assembly with a view to framing the constitution of a free, united and democratic India. Gandhi came to guide the committee's deliberations. President Jawaharlal Nehru urged the people to be united and strong so as to be prepared to face the new problems arising out of the ending of the foreign regime. Persuading the Congress to join the Constituent Assembly, Gandhi asserted it should be a challenge to combat and not a ground for rejection. 
giving a picture of the independent India of his conception. Gandhi wrote, Every village will have to be a republic or panchayat, having full powers. In this non-violent society, life will not be a pyramid, but an oceanic circle, whose center will be the individual, always ready to perish for the village. He made it clear that in such a society, every religion would have its full and equal place. A call by the Muslim League to observe August 16, 1946 as Direct Action Day to protest against the proposed formation of the interim government let loose an orgy of violence at Calcutta. Madness seized a section of humanity which killed, maimed and burnt. The fury spread burning its way into Naukhali and Tripura, rural areas of East Bengal. Then began an increasing migration of refugees. Communal hatred spread to adjoining Bihar and other parts of the country. Gandhi explained their duty to the ashram inmates. We should have rushed into the blaze and offered the purest sacrifice to quench the flames of the conflagration. With these words, he took their leave and left for Delhi. After prolonged controversy, the interim government came into being with Jawaharlal Nehru as the de facto Prime Minister on September 2nd, 1946. The ministers and members of the working committee assembled at the sweeper's slums to seek guidance from Gandhi. Greeting the new government, Gandhi described the day as a step towards full independence and fervently hoped that the salt tax would be annulled, that the ministers would live and die for communal unity and lead India on the road to truth and purity, and that the people would cooperate with them in this endeavor. Pouring out his soul's agony over the dark happenings in the country, Gandhi bemoaned, the springs of life in India appear to be dry today. The cry of blood for blood is barbarous. Independence of India is today at stake in Bengal and Bihar. Unless I can stem the violence, life has no attraction for me. The cry of outraged womanhood called him to Bengal and he came to wipe their tears and put heart into them. Gandhi was on the way to Naukhali in search of the divine in the maddened man. His mission was to establish heart unity between the sister communities, for he regarded all mankind as his kith and kin and dreaded the consequences of the bisection of India. To justify his inheritance, man had to return good for evil, he declared, and added, love and tolerance between the unlike are greater virtues than between the likes. Pilgrim of Peace arrived in Naukhali to venture in faith. 
In the midst of the thick palm groves, Gandhi pitched his camp and buried himself in the devastated areas to purge the hearts of the people of hatred. The stink of death still hung over the place. Gandhi set out on his peace plan and talked to the downhearted. His technique of non-violence was on trial. Emphasizing the need for complete religious toleration, he maintained, in every province, everyone is an Indian, be he a Hindu, a Muslim, or of any other faith. He expected the majority to constitute itself into the guardian of the minority. In Gandhi's presence, fear fled and the hold of fanatical terror loosened. People flocked to him for advice and comfort. He was happy to see the dead souls return to life and this was reward enough for his mission. Naukhali became to him the nodal point governing the future course of events for the whole of India. On December 27th, Jawaharlal Nehru came to Sri Rampur to seek Gandhi's advice on important political matters. During Nehru's sojourn, Gandhi explained to him the technique of non-violence he was pursuing in Naukhali. Getting fresh inspiration from Gandhi, Nehru remarked, I feel a little younger and stronger after meeting this young man of 77. Gandhi stood at the door of his hut and probed his future path. On the morning of January 7th, 1947, the barefoot pilgrim commenced his historic one-night, one-village march from Chandipur. The way was dark, and he had naught but the twin stars of truth and non-violence to light his perilous trail. He strolled on the narrow village roads, mingling freely with the Hindus and the Muslims and expounding his gospel of communal unity and peace. Trekking from village to village and knocking from door to door, he sought close contacts with the people 
in his attempt to reinforce the human bond between the two communities and bring the shattered villages to sanity and composure. This was an experiment in the non-violence of the strong. Touring through miles of difficult terrain, Gandhi finished the first stage of his tour after 28 days of walking crowded by experiences both sweet and bitter. On the morning of February 5th, the second part of his tour commenced. Tireless in his pursuit of communal harmony, the pilgrim progressed, making his way through the inaccessible delta of the Ganga. If they answer not thy call, walk alone. If they do not hold up the light, when the night is troubled with storm, with the thunder flame of pain, ignite thine own heart, and let it burn alone. During the seven weeks pilgrimage, Gandhi walked about 116 miles through 47 villages. The epic of Naukhali closed after four months when he boarded the steamer at Chandpur on March 2nd, on the way to Bihar to still the raging fury. <laughs> 